Hello everybody, I'm Raphael Perry and it's time to return to Fighting Fantasy Classics. We're playing the Forest of Doom, we are south of the river, and it's good to be back, you know. Just having a nice relaxing time at a quarter to four in the morning. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, walking along the path you hear footsteps and arguing voices ahead of you. Well, we could hide in the bushes like some cowardly scamp. However, look at these numbers right here. Look at these numbers. These are the markings of a mighty warrior. It's not so much. I think if there's any significant trouble, we can probably handle it. You drew your sword and prepare to meet the owners of the arguing voices. Two tall, spindly creatures appear, clad in tattered cloth over which they wear chainmail jackets. They see you and instantly stop their argument. They are hobgoblins and draw their swords to attack you. You must fight! Absolutely. Oh, this is a slightly new layout. So. Our whole golden foe has a skill of 6 and a stamina of 6. With a skill of 6, our skill is 12. That's a 6 difference. Basically, we're going to win most rounds, so let us fight! Are we the white dice or the red dice? Um, tap to continue? Well, I suppose I'll just click here then. Well, I absolutely intend to see this one through. There we go. Yep. So it's a fairly simple combat system, and one that does encourage mathematics and is useful for younger readers. Let's finish him off. Were we a less skillful combatant, I would be a little more wary about this. You have defeated the first Hobgoblin and now must face the second Hobgoblin! Well, there were two of them. Oh, he's a little bit tougher, but he's not so good at fighting, which means we're probably just going to mash straight through him, to be honest. Oh, good grief. Yeah, he's kind of dead right there. <laughs> Should be three more rounds. Not even going to waste luck on this because we don't have very much luck. In all fairness, we have been rather gifted in the character creation department, so the thing about the majority of fights in fighting fantasy is they're not it you know, this isn't this isn't Oblivion or Skyrim, right? Not every fight has to be a life or death fight to a death. This is more of a you might take a few injuries and they're whittle you down slowly over the course of the adventure kind of deal. We are victorious! You search through the pockets of the hobgoblins and find three gold pieces, a tiny brass flute and two maggot-ridden biscuits, which will restore one stamina each, but they're also revolting. There is also a necklace made of mouse skulls around one of their necks. Don't think we're going to need the necklace of mouse skulls at any point in time. Oh, we do also have a interesting new map. So... This is laid out like a, um, like a kind of, it's, it's not a map map, because that should be north, east, north again. So it's more of a weird sort of, uh, relative rather than an actual accurate representation map. To the left of the path, you notice a large hole in the ground with a diameter of some three meters. That's a wide hole. Walking over to the edge of the hole, you see it sloping off into the depths of the earth. We will absolutely go down here and explore. As you descend into the hole, you notice large amounts of slime secreted by some huge creature. We could... Yeah, you know, that, that's starting to look dangerous now. We could carry on out of here. But this creature could have captured one of those two goblins and dragged half of Gillibrand's famous Warhammer down into its pit. 
So we should go down just in case, even though it's section 15, which has a nice illustration if I recall correct. Well, there is an illustration. Where? Okay, that is just weird. Hmm. One moment. Um. Hmm. No. It's not showing up for some reason. That's a shame. Okay. Wait, why is that off? Hmm. Well, it was off before. Okay. Don't know what's going there. Hmm. Uh, might have to report that one. Okay. The slope is steep and you slip on the slime, tumbling head over heels down the hole to the bottom into a large earthen cavern. You jump to your feet and are alarmed to see the shiny tip of a poison barb on the tail end of a huge stingworm coming straight at you. The stingworm is about five meters long and has huge yellow segments, but all you care about is protecting yourself from the barb. There is no time to scramble out of the hole. You draw your sword! There used to be a really nice picture here of a stingworm in the cave with its tail rearing up with a big sting on the end. It was pretty nasty. And I don't know why it's not showing. So let us fight the stingworm. Alright. Four difference. Reasonable. There we go. Yeah, we might take a bit of damage here, but that's okay. And yet... We seem to be handling things fairly well. Ooh. Why are you a uh, reroll? That is weird. Oh, is it a draw? That was bizarre. If you defeat this gargantuan horror, we absolutely did, even though its illustration wasn't showing. You walk around the lifeless bulk of the worm to examine the contents of its lair. There are several skeletons, perhaps these, perhaps those belonging to other unfortunate adventurers. By the side of one of them, you find a leather backpack. Inside the backpack, you find four gold pieces and a small corked bottle containing a colorless liquid. We could drink the contents of a bottle, or leave. I don't think we can take it with us. I wonder if the map uh, might have messed with the illustrations. Interesting. Let's see. No, it looks like we can't take that with us. Um, well, we're in no particular need of any kind of potion right now, so I'm going to just not drink that, because I honestly can't remember if it would be helpful or not. So it's time to scramble up the path again, back to the path through the woods. At last the trees begin to thin out and shafts of sunlight beam down through the gaps on either side of the path. As the path widens, you see a large cave entrance set a few yards back on the right. We shall absolutely explore this cave. I mean, there we go. There's an illustration. Yeah. Slowly you peer into the cave and see a huge shape of an ogre walking slowly over to a wicker cage with a bowl of water in his great hand. He is dressed in animal furs and carries a stone club in his belt. There appears to be a small creature jumping around inside the cage, and there's a lot of page space here wasted that could have words on it. You may pick up a rock and throw it at the ogre, rush in and attack the ogre with your sword, or leave it... Well, we're going to pick up a rock and throw it. If we possess a glove of missile dexterity, which we absolutely do, it shall be used. You reach into your backpack and pull out the purple silk glove. It fits snugly on your hand. 
You then bend down and pick up a good sized rock and take aim. You throw the rock with all your might at the ogre and it flies like an arrow to hit him in the side of the head, knocking him unconscious. The creature in the cage jumps around even more than before. We can take a closer look at the creature in the cage, search through the contents of the cave. We will look at the creature in the cave, in the cage, because the contents of the cave aren't going anywhere. Inside the cage is a small, sinewy creature with brown, scaly sk skin. Sorry. Inside the cage, a small, sinewy creature with brown, scaly skin is jumping up and down. He is a goblin! Around his neck hangs a black shiny rod on a leather cord. Well, we absolutely need that, so we are letting... Well, we're getting in there. You unlock the door and step back, drawing your sword in case the goblin tries to attack you. He picks up a wooden stool and, waving it in the air, kicks the door open and charges at you, screaming, <coughs> All right, goblin. You malnourished little piece of filth. Taste my blade. Oh my. That's okay. He is destroyed. Sorry, getting a bit mucusy, so I might have to cut this one a little short. My voice might sound all sort of dry and there, a bit scratchy. You bend down over the lifeless body of the mad goblin and examine the rod around its neck. The rod is made of ebony and there is a screw thread on one end. You're excited to see the letter G neatly inscribed at the other end of what must be the handle of the dwarvish warhammer. You put your find in your backpack and gain one luck point. Unfortunately, we cannot exceed our starting luck, so it remains at eight. We may search through the contents of the cave. Let's do that. But be careful, because the ogre might wake up. There is not much of interest to be found in the cave. A straw bed, stone jars, a table, a chair are all that remain. They're all that is immediately visible. But on a stone shelf above the bed, a small silver box catches your eye. I seem to remember poison dust in the silver box. I'm not so sure though. I don't think the hammerhead's going to fit in there, so let's just leave the cave and head on up the path without the silver box. Walking along the path, you do not notice a rope noose hidden beneath some fallen leaves ahead of you. Your foot catches in the noose and suddenly you are hauled into the air by the rope which is tied to a sprung tree. In a second you are hanging upside down, suspended by your trapped foot and we must test our luck. Oh wow. You are lucky. You needed a luck score of 8 or below and rolled a luck score of 8. Now, luck usually diminishes with use. Why is it still... Okay, well, we were lucky. Has it now gone down? Why did it not go down? That's bizarre. You should... Your luck should be reduced by one every time you test your luck. Your sword remains in its scabbard and you're able to use it to cut yourself down from a man trap. You get to your feet and curse, brushing the dirt from your clothes with your hands. You are tempted to wait around to discover who set the trap, but decide against it. You continue northwards. You notice a knotted vine hanging down to the ground from a tree on your left. You look up and see a roughly made treehouse amid the branches. We can climb up the vine to the treehouse, or continue walking along the path. Let's climb up. You reach the top of the vine and scramble on to a wooden platform. A sheet made from leaves and ferns covers the entrance to a small, covered living area. As you approach, the sheet is thrown back, and from behind it steps a large and hairy, ape-like creature wearing only an animal hide loincloth. He is holding a large bone in his right hand and grunts at you. He is an ape-man. We can attack him, or jump off the platform to the ground five meters below. That's a, like a 16, 17, what's, hang on. It's like an 18-foot drop, isn't it? No way. The Ape Man is very agile around the tree, and you have difficulty brandish your sword. You may lose two from attack strength during each round of combat. Well, we're still a pretty good fighter, so that's too diff in our favour. There we go. Yep. 
I still don't know why our luck hasn't been diminished. That's very awkward. Okay. Getting closer to losing a round, but for now, we are victorious. You step over the body of the ape man and enter his living area. Animal bones and rotting fruit litter the floor. The ape man's bed is made of moss and lichen and seems to be crawling with bugs. You shudder and step back out onto the platform. You then notice a copper bracelet around the ape man's wrist. Uh, we can put it on or leave. Now let's see. Somewhere in this adventure there's a magical helmet which increases skill, a magical glove and a magical bracelet. One of them is cursed and reduces skill. I think it's this bracelet. I'm not sure. And more importantly, our skill is very high, so I'm gonna not risk it, climb down the vine for path and carry on walking northwards. Soon the path leads out of the trees onto a large plain with tall grasses. Beyond it you see rising ground and further off some low hills. The path splits and goes in three directions. You can go west, east or north. I believe this is where we go west. I believe. Um, interesting way these have been arranged. It's not as representative. Unless this is weirdly... No, I, I can't see um, how that would... Okay, so we can go out and in. So, west it is. This is where we break the fighting fantasy rule for one of the two times in this book. Unless I'm misremembering and we need to break it a bit further northwards. But okay. The path ends at another junction. The way south leads back to the forest, so you decide to head north. Yeah, we should have gone north one more than west, I think. Walking quickly along the path through waist-high grass, you arrive at another junction in the path. You may continue going north or west. I believe this is where we wish to go west. Wait. Okay, we've missed it. We need to go west to section 99. From not too far ahead comes the sharp noise of barking dogs drawing nearer. Suddenly a brown fox with eyes wide open in fear dashes past you running fast. The frantic yelping of the dogs gets louder. We can face the oncoming pack of dogs or hide in the tall grasses of the path and let them rush past in pursuit of a fox. They are hunting hounds. Let's not a wait. Because this, this is the masked hunter, isn't it? Uh, I can't remember. Do we fight with dogs before he arrives or not? Well, let's just face them and see. Oh, good. You draw your sword and stand to face a pack of dogs. They come into view in a cloud of dust. Galloping behind them is a masked rider wearing a long flowing cloak and riding a white stallion. He blows a horn and the pack of dogs comes to a sudden halt in front of you. There are four of them and you see that they are hunting dogs. The stallion stands motionlessly behind them with steam blowing from its nostrils in two long jets. The masked man looks at you without speaking. We may start a conversation with him or attack the nearest dog. I... no, I... Uh, I don't see much purpose in attacking the dogs, to be honest. And he did kind of call them off. You nod your head at the masked rider and bid him good day. He nods back but says nothing. You tell him of your quest to help the dwarfs of Stonebridge. He then jumps down from his mount, throws back his cape and extends his right arm to shake your hand. You see that each of his fingers is adorned by a large gold ring. We could attack him for his gold, that's not very heroic. Or carry on the conversation. Well, it's been rather one-sided so far, but let's see where it goes. The man smiles and takes off his mask, explaining that he wore it to protect himself against the dust and not to hide the face of a robber. You sheath your sword and relax a little. The man tells you that he is a hunter and that the best game in all the northern borderlands can be found on this grassy plain within Darkwood Forest. He says that his hounds were chasing a wild boar when they lost its scent and picked up that of a fox, mistaken. He warns you of some of the dangerous beasts that lurk in these parts and finally says, And if you're going to spend the night in Darkwood Forest, you might need some of this. 
He drops some belladonna into your hand and jumps back on his stallion. You thank him and then with a sudden blow of his horn, the dogs run off east. He turns and waves to you before galloping off in pursuit of his dogs. You put the belladonna in your pack and set off west again. Absolutely. You soon arrive at a crossroads. The way south leads back to the forest, so you decide to ignore it. We shall turn west to section 99. Where another illustration is missing. That's so bizarre. Interesting. Ahead you see that the path ends at the door of a large hut made of dried mud. It has a domed roof and a single window. You peer through the window and see a large man with dark skin sitting at a table in the middle of a hut. He is bare chested and is flexing the muscles on his arms. And in the picture he had really corded muscles and an interest yeah, you know, distinctive ponytail. We shall enter the hut. I don't know why pictures aren't quite showing up at the moment, it's weird. As you enter the hut, the big man smiles. He looks pleased to see you and starts to speak in a deep voice. Welcome, stranger. My name is Quinn and I earn my living by my arms. Would you care for a little wager, perhaps at arm wrestling? You know, we might as well, if it's all he does. There we go, and we do have an armband of strength. Of course, when Quinn the Eskimo gets here, everybody's going to jump for joy. <laughs> come on, without. Come on, within. You've not seen nothing like the mighty Quinn. Quinn explains that he will wager some dust of levitation against an item or coins to the value of ten gold pieces. As you sit down on the table opposite him, you deftly slip the armband of strength onto your arm. You sit down on the table, sit down to it. Sit down at the table. That's, sit down to the table. That's really weird. Huh. You put your elbow onto the table and lock hands with him. His grip is like an iron jaw and his dark eyes look confident. His biceps bulge and he gives the signal for the contest to begin. You start to push his arm down and are amazed at your own strength. Sweat breaks out on his forehead and you can see the disbelief and pain on his face. You push harder and force his arm onto the table in defeat. Had we not had the armband of strength, there would have been a series of opposed dice rolls there, or it might have even just been a roll under skill, I'm not sure. But we did bring our armband of strength and it is now all used up and gone. It's still there. These are supposed to be single-use items. There's something very wrong going on here. Luck isn't deplenishing. Is this what standard mode is like? The standard mode cheat went... Oh, that's not good. I have to look into that, but oh well. Quinn stands up and walks silently to a wooden chest at the back of the hut. He lifts the lid and pulls out a small glass vial. He hands it to you and walks back to the table where he slumps in his chair looking thoroughly dejected. The dust in the file sparks in the light and you put it into your backpack and leave the hut. Outside you walk back to the junction of the path. I feel like giving him the armband of strength as a gift. It just doesn't feel right, but we absolutely need that dust of levitation. Well, we don't entirely need it, but we'll have a really hard time if we don't have it. You arrive back at the crossroads. Ignoring the way south, back to the forest, we may go north or head east. East will be back the way we came. We're going to go north. As you walk further northwards across the plain, the grass gradually becomes shorter and the ground starts to rise gently. Ahead you hear the roar of crashing water. Soon you reach the bank of a wide river split on two levels. To your right, the water is calm and slow moving, but in front of you it tumbles noisily down a waterfall to a gorge below where the river narrows and runs quickly west over rocks and boulders. Steps lead down by the side of the waterfall to the bottom of the gorge, although it's difficult to see where they end because of the spray thrown up. Across the river you see the path heading north into the distance. A small wooden boat is tied to a post to your right where the river is calm. We may take the steps down or row the boat across. 
I don't think we can trust the boat. It might be old and knackered. The steps, however, are a little more reliable. And we are trusting only in our legs. You walk down the slippery stone steps to the bottom of the waterfall. You look up and see a magnificent rainbow reflected in the spray. It is dark in the gorge and impossible to see through the wall of water where the steps end. We may walk through the water or climb back up the stone steps. Let's just go through the waterfall. Hey, it's the Fishman picture! Ah, oh, so many fond memories. Yeah, Fishman picture. <laughs> Disturbingly upright. <laughs> you walk along the steps through the waterfall and into a large cavern where there is a pool of still water. The steps run round the side of the pool and there is a stone table and a chair on the far side. You go to the table and see fish scraps lying on it. So he's a cannibal! He's a cannibalistic fish man! Suddenly you hear a noise of splashing behind you. A strange creature climbs out of a pool and advances towards you armed with a trident. His legs are like a man's but his face and torso resemble a large green fish with bulbous eyes. His arms are like yours but are covered in large scales. He is a fish man and you must fight him. We shall absolutely fight the fish man. Okay, we have a 5 stamina advantage. Rolling 2 dice, which will give us a number from 2 to 12. Essentially, if we roll an 8 or higher, we're winning whatever happens. Okay. 7 diff, we might have just... no, a draw, okay. One of the advantages of many years playing fighting fantasy game books is being able to calculate the skill difference rather quickly. Because it saves having to add up the dice every single round. The Fishman is defeated. There is nothing of use or value in the Fishman's cave, so you walk around to the north side wall. Steps lead back through the waterfall and up the north wall of the gorge to the top. You're at the foot of some hills and can see the path climbing up through their midst in the north. Climbing up into their midst in the north. It is getting dark and night is closing in, so you decide to camp behind some rocks to the right of the path. You build a large fire and settle down to sleep with your sword by your side. You've been asleep for about an hour when the noise of deep growling wakes you up. You stand up without making a noise and grab your sword. You wait and listen. There is a full moon in the sky for the second night running, and the light casts eerie shadows all around. You hear soft footsteps and sniffing, followed by another low growl. Then a shape which looks like a man steps out of the shadows to your right. As he gets closer, you see that his chest, arms and face are covered with thick brown hair and long teeth protrude from his mouth. He is a werewolf and you must fight! Now this is a slightly more dangerous fight, obviously, because we don't want to get infected. So having a high skill here is a significant advantage. Let's hope it pays off. There we go. Oh, wow. We rolled low and so did our foe. Okay, we do have the advantage, so that tides us over there. Two more rounds. Okay, just, yep. Just by one. And now for the final blow. There we go. The werewolf did not wound us during our fight, so we get to restore a point of luck. So I wonder if the, um, the luck being added is being kept as a buffer. Because that would be really weird. Eventually you manage to get back to sleep, but have a restless night. In the morning you collect your belongings and head north along the path into the hills. And this is where my memory gets a little more hazy regarding the remainder of the adventure. I remember all the main points, but not necessarily how it lays out. So hey, that's good, right? Because I could mess up, make mistakes, have to go through it all again, you know. The ground is quite steep as the path winds its way into the hills. 
By the time you reach the top of the sun is quite hot. All around in the distance you see the dark green circle of darkwood forest. Mist still hangs in the tall grasses behind you, but ahead you see a valley floor bathed in sunlight. All is quiet. As you start down the far side of the hill, you see a junction of a path. We can continue north down the hill hill or east along a new branch. Um, I think we want to go north at least once before starting to head east. The path runs through a narrow gorge between two hills. You feel vulnerable and draw your sword expecting to be ambushed at any moment. Unfortunately, because you are concentrating on watching the sides of the gorge, you do not see a small patch of leaves and branches on the path ahead. Your foot goes right through the thin covering of a trap and you plunge four meters to the bottom of a rocky pit. To add to your misfortune, a wooden stake with a sharp tip points out from the center of the pit. I think we may have taken a wrong turn. Okay, we've been lucky. Our luck should now, however, be reduced to six. And it's still eight. Why is luck not being reduced? You manage to avoid landing on the wooden stake, and, but fall heavily on the floor, losing two stamina points in the process. We are still alive, however, and we do have our boots of leaping. The pit is circular with smooth sides, and you are weak from your fall. You reach into your backpack and pull out the brown leather boots. They are very light on your feet. You crouch down, and in one mighty leap you are out of the pit. You dust yourself down and continue your walk north down the gorge. Continuing down the gorge, you see the handle of a sword sticking out from a large rock by the side of a path. Well, we are a hero. Let's do something stereotypical and heroic and try to pull that sword free. Especially since we can't fail to roll under our skill score. Wait. Equal to or less than your current skill score. Is our, Are our skill and luck mixed up? We have the skill of 12 and it said we needed an 8. If it's trying to reduce skill instead of luck, that would just be really weird. Hmm. Well, something fishy is going on, but that was a successful roll. The sword slowly slides out of the rock. The sword is magnificent and was obviously made by a master craftsman. It feels powerful in your hand. You gain two points on top of your current skill score when using your enchanted sword. Cutting your new weapon through the air, you set off north down the gorge. So now, we should have a skill of 14 over, over 12. That is not displaying at all. That's really weird. Well, we'll see how it goes when we get to a fight. Between the hills, you see the flat green valley floor stretching out ahead and beyond a sinister wall of trees, Darkwood Forest. On the other side of the trees lies Stonebridge, your journey's end. Arriving on the valley floor, the path ends at a junction. West, oh yeah, it's east a lot, then north, then west, and yeah, 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 yeah. You walk along the green valley floor, brings you to a junction of a path. Uh, following the fighting fantasy rule, we would here go north. Let's to the left of the path, you notice a large mud pool bubbling loudly. Steam rises from from the thick bubble, breaking the surface on the mud. You may fray a gold piece in if you have one. Rub some hot mud on our wounds or continue north. Let's rub some nice warm mud on our wounds. Your wounds heal before your eyes due to the magical properties of the mud. You gain four stamina points. Wonderful. Well, we were at full, near enough to full health anyway, so we've just been restored to full. And that's okay. Feeling much better, you set off north along the path. High in the sky, you see a large flying creature. It is certainly bigger than any bird you have ever seen. As it comes closer, you draw your sword. It screeches loudly and you can see its long head and a mouth full of sharp teeth. Its green skin is reptilian and its wings span some five meters. There is nowhere to take cover on the valley floor and you must fight the pterodactyl swooping down on you. Absolutely. All right, so we should be on a 14 now. We are not getting the benefit of our magic sword. Something really weird is going on. And I don't know why. 
items aren't being used, and this is all very strange. I don't know what's going on, but something very weird is happening. Did the difficulty change? I don't know, but something very strange is going on and I'm not happy about it. High in the sky you see a large flying creature. It is certainly bigger than any bird you have ever seen. As it comes closer you draw your sword. It screeches loudly and you can see its long head and mouth full of sharp teeth. Oh, it's the pterodactyl we just fought us. Thought that was a victory section. A loathsome pterodactyl lies in a crumpled heap where it crashed to the floor after a fatal blow from your sword. Walking over to it, you notice a yellow arrow painted on the grass beside the path, pointing to the west. We shall... Ig okay, so that's a, a clue. The kind of clue that could be saying, go this way. I believe it leads to the narrow gorge getting ambushed by the two hillsmen who shoot arrows and then... Yeah. So let's not go that way because it could be a trap. Someone's painted it there. They clearly want to get our attention, but it's it's not exactly subtle. If you wish to keep going north along the path, absolutely. Continue on your walk along the valley floor. You see a large wall of darkwood forest looming up before you once again. The path leads directly into the thick undergrowth, and soon you are walking through... <coughs> oh, sorry, yeah, get, throat's getting a bit raspy. Soon you are walking between tall trees and crowded thorn bushes. It is dark and quiet. Before long, the path comes to a junction. We could head west or east. Following the fighting fancy rule, it's time to go east. On the ground in front of you lies a single gold piece. You pick it up and toss it in the air with a flick of your thumb. When you put it in your pocket, gain one point of luck. We haven't used much luck yet. Oh, we are far off the beaten track now. We are in very wrong places. Somewhere after the river, I took a wrong turn. Walking along the path, you see a small man wearing an iron helmet and a chainmail coat sitting on a log by the side of the path. He is a dwarf, and he does not look very pleased to see you. We can start a conversation with him, draw a sword and attack him, push him off the log and run east along... Why would we push him off the log? No, just say hello. You ask the dwarf if he comes from Stonebridge. He glares at you and jumps to his feet, grabbing his axe. He tells you that he hates the dwarfs of Stonebridge and that he is searching Darkwood Forest for Gillibrand's Warhammer to take it back to his village, Milewater, in the west. He tells you that his name is Trumbull and that his favourite eagle has been lost while attempting to seize Gillibrand's Warhammer. You realise that you are talking to an enemy of Stonebridge. You lose a point of luck. And that has actually been deducted. Well, good. I don't know why the magic sword isn't working or why luck hasn't been reduced before. We shall attack Trumbull. Because he is an evil scumbag. He was responsible for stealing the hammer in the first place. The dwarf is a hardy old fighter and swings his axe with great skill. Well, we have a magic sword, which apparently we're not even using. Ha! We actually took some damage. Nice one. There we go. Yeah, our magic sword is not working. Additionally, we've had no luck deduction from testing luck. Something very odd is going on. You m rummage through the dwarf's backpack and find an interesting piece of painted canvas as well as a corked bottle containing a clear liquid. 
Well, let's absolutely drink his thing he had with him, because we're going to presume that he was going to drink it at some point. You drink the clear liquid slowly from a bottle. It tastes very bitter and you're apprehensive about what you've done. But then a glow radiates through your body and you feel invigorated. You have drunk a health potion and gained three stamina points to your score. You set off east along the path. You arrive at another junction in the path. Ignoring the way south, you continue east. The path continues to another junction. The way south leads back to the valley, so you decide to stay on the forest and stay in the forest and head off. So basically these junctions have been parallel to those south of the river. Where there's like the three or four paths that cross the river. And we've just come up on the left hand side and gone all the way across. And now we're going up again. Ahead you hear the thumping of heavy footsteps and the noise of breach. Branches breaking. Breaches breaking would be rather disturbing. Ah, it sounds as though some huge creature is coming down the path towards you. Well, let's face it. Actually, it sounds pretty massive, but yeah, let's face it, because it's a great picture. Ha ha ha, look at those tiny little trees. The thumping and crashing gets louder, and suddenly you see a huge leg appear in front of you. Looking up, you see that the leg belongs to a man some five meters tall. He is wearing green canvas clothing and fur boots. He appears to be in a hurry and is crashing through the undergrowth as though it isn't there. He is a forest giant. On seeing you, his eyes widen and he raises his great wooden club. We shall fight the giant. I think it's a shame that the fight is always over onto the next page, because otherwise we could have the picture of the creature we face there. Hey, we actually took damage. Nice. Twice. Well, good for the giant, I say. We have a magic sword and we're not even using it. Oh, uh, why did that? That was weird. I think it just flips the dice over on a draw. For some reason. I'm... <laughs> Look, I'm clicking. That's bizarre. So something is definitely going on weird. Stuffed inside the forest giant's clothing, you find a brass lantern with a green wick. There is no liquid inside it to burn. Perhaps it is a magic lantern. We can rub the lantern and make a wish, try to light the wick. Well, it's kind of empty, so that wouldn't make much sense. But yeah, let's rub it and see if anything happens. We may just get... Hmm. As you rub the lantern, green smoke slowly starts to rise from the wick and take shape. It forms the outline of a fat old man with a bald head sitting on a cushion. His mouth opens slowly and in a deep voice he says, Well, what do you want? You tell him of your quest, but he tells you that he is unable to offer you material gain or wealth. He can only offer you personal well-being. You may restore your st skill, stamina, or luck to its initial level. Well, looking at our adventure sheet, I'm going to go with stamina just to see if you, uh, testing our luck later on will actually diminish it correctly or not. As soon as you make your choice, the genie disappears and the lantern turns black. You throw it to the ground and head north. The path twists and turns and then makes a sharp, sudden, a sudden sharp turn to the west. Following the new course, you are aware of squawking in the trees all around you. You hear the flapping of wings and looking up see three large birds swooping down on you. Their beaks and talons look razor sharp. You have only a second. You only have a second in which to draw your sword and defend yourself against the Death Hawks. Uh, Death Hawks actually made it into the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Fiend Folio. And they were submitted by a certain Mr. Ian Livingston. So, good for him. Alright, yeah, we're probably taking damage this time. That's what puts us on 17. Oh, but wait. 7 and 4 is 11. Yeah, forget it. We're kind of 
8 difference, we're basically not going to take any damage here. But there are three of them. So let's face that second death orc. They are not a massive threat. And the dice are being weird again. Go away! And finally, the third death orc. The, the rules for fighting multiple opponents only appeared later on in this book, towards the back end of it, for a nastier encounter towards the end. It was, this was possibly the first fighting fantasy book to include rules for fighting multiple opponents, whereas previously it had always been they fight one at a time. And the dice are not wanting to cooperate, that is bizarre. There we go. One of the Deaf Hawks has a silver band around one of its legs. It has an inscription on it which reads, Death awaits you. You decide to leave the silver and head quickly west. You soon arrive at another junction of a path. Looking at Big Leg's map, you decide to head north again in the direction of Stonebridge, ignoring the narrow path which continues west. And, you know, I'm thinking I'll wrap the episode soon. The path opens out into a small clearing. Oh yeah, we are... We are way off track now. We've, we've missed the location we were looking for. To your right, you see a pile of branches, grass and pieces of rag. The lair of some large creatures. Amongst the debris and old bones scattered, you catch sight of something glittering. Um... I think I just want to hurry on. This is not the place I'm looking for. Yeah, what did I say? Oh. Walking along the narrow path, you suddenly hear the sharp crack of a twig breaking and the whispering of lower voices. You draw your sword and wait anxiously with your back to a large oak tree. Then, from behind the trees opposite you, step four men and a woman dressed in green tunics. Each looks menacing and they stand with swords and axes in their hands. The young woman steps forward and tells you that you're trespassing on their territory and you must pay a levy of five objects from your backpack or face the consequences. We can give them what they want or... Ha! We are playing a mighty warrior. We'll spit on the ground and tell them we'd rather die. The bandit woman steps forward with her sword raised shouting, DEATH TO THE INTRUDER! She is their leader, and you must fight! You know... She's got some skill, but just not enough. <laughs> there we go. The next two bandits approach you. Time to fight, and here, the rules for fighting multiple opponents were, I believe... Oh, they were not included. I thought they were, originally. Oh well. Just have to murder them one at a time then, very honourable of them. And it's just tossing the dice around for some reason. Okay, you've defeated the first bandit, now you must face the next one. Well, he seems like he'll fare even worse than his predecessor, to be honest. He is not the most adept with a blade. There we go. Finally, you need to take up the remaining bandits. Absolutely. Go. Just whittle this one down. One blow at a time. Ah. <laughs> so maybe it only messes with the dice when it's trying to resolve. A dice roll hasn't fully loaded results yet. You have defeated the first bandit, now you must fix the next one, or rather the last one. 
Oh god, his skill survive. He is dead. He is dead, dead as a dodo, dead as a doornail, just dead. And now for that horrible truth. A search of their clothing reveals nothing of interest apart from two gold pieces which you put in your backpack. You set off north again along the path and soon notice the trees thinning, beginning to thin out on either side of the path. Eventually the path leads out of the trees into a ploughed field. You are out of Darkwood Forest. The path leads through the field of a stone bridge. How to a stone bridge, not the field of a stone bridge. Also, it was nice that this was the first illustration to feature uh, a shadowy, you know, the shadow of the protagonist to give us an outline. It's it's a little more defining, but it's okay, you know. We got these two little fellows up here on the other side of the bridge. The path leads through the field to a stone bridge over a clear stream. Beyond the bridge are the small cottages and wooden huts of a village. A sign on the bridge reads Stone Bridge. You cross the bridge and see two old dwarfs with long white beards standing by a cottage looking at you. Do you have the hammerhead and the handle with the letter G inscribed on them? If only we did, if you possess neither or only one of these, which we do, sadly. You have failed in your quest to help the dwarfs. Being unable to fail, face Gillibrand, their king, you decide to head east and find a place to rest after your perilous adventure. But wait! Perhaps you can continue searching. Let us do that. You decide the best way to continue looking is to walk back around Darkwood Forest and pay a visit to Yastromo. As you begin the long walk, you are attacked by a large group of wild hillmen. Probably the same group who attacked Big Leg and his party two days earlier. We shall test our luck. Sadly, your luck has run out. You needed a luck score of 7 or below and you rolled a luck score of 8. Oh well. If you are unlucky, you are showered by arrows. There is no way you survive and your adventure in Darkwood Forest is over. You are dead. You have been beaten by Darkwood Forest. The Forest of Doom. The end. That's a real shame. Well, I think we did okay for a first run. I didn't manage to find the hammerhead in the crypt with the ghoul. But we would have needed the silver key to get right anyway, and I can't remember how to do it. So, Citadel of Chaos and Forest of Doom are the only two books in the Fighting Fantasy series to allow the player to go back to the beginning and try again, at a certain failure state point near the end. That has not been um, added in at any other point in any of the other books. I'm going to absolutely dive in and play Forest of Doom again at some point myself, but for now... I'm going to wrap up the episode and next time I'll be playing another adventure. You know what? We did not succeed, but I hope you enjoyed it anyway. I'll say bye-bye for now and cheerio!